Well, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Philip Slaby. Um, I'm a f uh, from Guilford College, um, just up the road in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. And I wanted to welcome you. Um, I'm serving as chair um, and excited to serve and honored to serve as chair for this fascinating panel. Um, these papers explore perhaps um, only in the way that migration history can, uh, the complex intersection of citizenship, race, tensions between the central state and local populations, um, and uh, the human uh, aspirations and more. Um, that operated in the uh, during the operation and the legacy of the uh, Bumidom, a set of institutions and policies uh, to channel migrants from the overseas departments to metropolitan France uh, that operated in the 1960s to the 1980s. So what we have uh, today is a little bit of a deviation from what you see in your program. There will be um, five papers presented um, instead of what you see. Um, and then what I'll do is, uh, as chair, offer the introduction to each paper and then a brief um, biography uh, introduction to each speaker as we go. Um, so the biographies of each speaker are very impressive. The, the long list of works that they've completed um, is uh, probably more than we can get into, but I'll invite everyone to maybe take a, a look and explore more of their work. Um, if I walked through and uh, uh, did justice to their biographies, we would not have time for any papers. Um, okay. So the first paper um, is in, uh, will be uh, entitled Migrant Citizens and Migrant Workers. Um, this is a presentation or a paper by Sylvain Patiou. Um, Sylvain is um, at the University of Paris 8 um, and is Associate Professor of History. He's published widely um, academic works, but also novels. Um, so I will turn it to you. Hmm. Good morning. Uh, I'm happy to be here in Charlotte, city now of uh, Michael Jordan, uh, hero, uh, when my hero when I was uh, a child. <laughs> um, inclusion, exclusion, this is uh, the title of your annual meeting. And uh, I will uh, speak about inclusion and exclusion across Bumidon. Bumidon. What a strange word. <laughs> it is Bureau pour le développement des migrations d'outre-mer. It was created in 1963 by Michel Debré, who was former Prime Minister and who was the man who wrote the Constitution of the Fifth Republic. So, it was someone. He was someone. So, what was, and it existed until 1981. So, what was Bumidom? What did Bumidom? It is a story of inclusion and exclusion. I will try to explain you, and we have. Uh, to answer the first question, what it was, we have to go back in the past. Sorry, I know uh, you like to dig the past, so you, you won't be afraid. But uh, we have to go back 15 years before, in 1946, after World War II. And we have to talk about departmentalization. Loi de départementalisation. This is a barbarian word, difficult to pronounce. In this year, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Guyane, and La Réunion, so-called Vieille Colonie, became département français. The administrative division born during the French Revolution. At the same time, leaders of col colonized population who, was, who were in the French Parliament succeeded to make the adoption of the Lamine Gray law. This law was very important because it considered that all the people who live in the French Empire became French citizens. It was very important, but 
What is to be citizen at this time, after World War II? It's not only a vote, it's not only a democratic question, it's also a question of social rights. And the twice are a problem for the French government. Democracy is a problem because a will equality uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, do that people, colonized people are more numerous than uh, French of metropolis. So uh, it is a big problem for the French government. But social rights is a big problem too because uh, it, it means that uh, uh, a lot of money would be necessary, a lot of, uh, of means would be necessary to, uh, to have a real equality. And you know that Frederick Cooper uh, wrote in uh, his, his book Français et Africain être citoyen au temps de la décolonisation that leaders of West Africa wanted an association with the metropolis at this time. They didn't want a pure independence. And this Lamine Gray law was the beginning of a struggle of many years until the independence to uh, fight for their rights. And uh, they didn't succeed to uh, be in association with, uh, with uh, France and uh, they obtained their independence. It was different in the so-called Vieille Colonie because population of the colony was less numerous, links were older, and it was the occasion for the French government, and especially, especially uh, at the end of the 50s for the Gaullists, to have a small-scale imperial politic, like an ersatz of imperial politic. And uh, leaders of Vieille Colony, like Aimé Césaire, were in favor of uh, departmentalization because they have great hopes. At the end of the 50s, those great hopes, like the great hopes of the leaders of West Africa, uh, became a big disappointment. And not only the leaders of the Vieille Colony were disappointed, but also the population. It was riots in Fort de France with a racial, uh, a, a racial uh, uh, place, a racial uh, e, uh, background, yes, with a racial background too. Sorry for my English. Uh, I speak English like a uh, Spanish co, but... <laughs> <laughs> and um, France at this time wanted to keep uh, his crumbs of empire. They wanted to keep the colony in the Republic. And they were afraid by Cuba, for example, the example of Cuba, because uh, Fidel Castro uh, uh, made a struggle to uh, have the liberation of the island from Batista. The answer to all these problems, this social problem, this democratic problem, because the departmentalization didn't, uh, didn't uh, make a real equality between uh, Vieille Colonie, Dome, and uh, France, Metropolis, France Hexagonal, as uh, people say uh, in, uh, in Dome. Uh, so the only answer they had was demographic. For them, it, it was an emergency with demography and they wanted to organize the migration of youth of the Dome. In a perspective, in a, they promised an upward mobility, and they were happy to organize this migration because uh, 
they need workforce in metropolis. 200,000 people uh, made this migration in 20 years. So it's a, it's a lot of people. One third of women with uh, origin, an originality of this kind of migration. And the place of this migration in the story of contemporary France let, uh, uh, had, has a large place in the national identity. At the beginning, so, this inclusion with departmentalization and with bumidum include a, large part, a little part of the empire to exclude, exclude excuse me, a large part of the empire. An inclusion who was an exclusion. And I, I arrive to my second point. What did Bumidum? I can't speak about everything, uh, so I will concentrate my uh, speech about professional training. Because this exclusion, exclusion of a large part of empire for a little crumb of empire, um, was a special sort of inclusion. An inclusion who was a differentiation too. Who was, of course, migrants were French citizens, but a special sort of French citizens with a specific politic, a specific social and cultural services, a specific association, and politic of political trainings, of, excuse me, politics of professional training is a good example. Because Bumidon wants to organize a migration of the poorest and the less qualified uh, people uh, of the young people of uh, of uh, Dom. That's a strange way, you know. In, at this time, uh, with the war in Ukraine, we have some deputies in France who said uh, we want Ukrainians because it's a, a good migration, people uh, of good qualities. So it seems strange that French states at this time organized migration of the less qualified and the poorest. They said inapt, recuperable, unable, uh, recu recuperable, I don't, I'm not sure, but <laughs> you, I, I, I'm sure you understand. And Bumidum has his own politic of professional training. Uh, I have forgotten my... Uh, uh, I have forgotten my uh, PowerPoint, who's, uh, which is a, a poor point, in fact, because it's not very... So, uh, we, I have uh, graphics. Uh, uh, I'm not sure you can read. It's may maybe too little. <laughs> so, his own pol politic of professional training, which concerns 10% of the migrants. So, it's, uh, it's important. And it was professional training, but also training to the life in metropolis, with a lot of stereotypes. It was an assignation, fixed destinies, and very gendered destinies. Because, uh, you know, uh, men, women, different sorts of migration. Cool. Ah, yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, political training, it's blue. 20,000, uh, 20, 22,000 people. So, this is the repartition of the professional training for the men uh, for the year uh, 70. <laughs> You know, workers of the bâtiment and industry in a big majority of uh, this professional training. So, of course, it was maybe an upward uh, mobility, but very little upward mobility. It doesn't change 10 years later, uh, 9 years later, the year I was born. For women, 
it, I said that it was very gendered. Women were destined to become household maid. For some of them, nurses or nurses' aid. They learned in a special place for formation, the centre of Cruy sur Ourc. And uh, they learn to become made, they learn to keep house, to use home appliances. You can see here how to do something uh, I never do with, uh, with shirt. <laughs> Because uh, it's difficult to do, but uh, sometimes I do, but uh, it's not uh, concurrent. <laughs> Uh, they they uh, learn to uh, cook, French cook too. And after that, bourgeois families went to Cruy sur Ourc and they chose their maid. Some of these women were workers in the industry or typists or assistants too, but it was a minority. And it, when they became workers in the industry, or typists, or assistants, it was because they had a lot of volunteer and uh, they didn't uh, accept the fixed identity what uh, Bumidom uh, wanted for them. Alors, Bumidom was not a very strong institution. It was a weak institution because they didn't have the means of their will. And because migrants are their own agency, they were French citizens, so if, the, if women wanted to flee Cruise uh, sur they can. If they wanted to flee the home, the bourgeois home where she, where she, she, where, uh, she, she can. And a lot of women, for example, refused their destiny. Uh, maybe you should uh, read the book of Françoise Ega, who was uh, made uh, in Marseille during the, the 50s and uh, 60s, and uh, it's a very uh, interesting book and a wonderful book. But this story of Bumidom is a proof to of racialization. Specific politic for a specific population, fixed destiny, stereotypes, It's a part of racialization of this population. For you, it is maybe an evidence, but let me, uh, uh, but uh, believe me, for us in France, at this time, it is a struggle to say and to prove it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> a memoir um, related to our topic. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you guys for attending this uh, this panel, and thank you to the whole conference organization committee for um, organizing this. It's really good for us to be able to present our work to um, a panel of historians who are specialists of France. This work, I mean, um, uh, uh, Sylvain has been working on the Bumidom and on the social history of Bumidom for several years, but we are also here because we are all part of a collective project that's funded by the French National Research Agency uh, that gathers um, historians, political scientists, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, there's one geographer uh, <laughs> in the project, and we're working on a number of things related to Bumidom and its aftermath. Uh, so right after this general presentation of what Bumidom is, uh, giving like the important dates and dynamics of the institution, I'd like to to talk a little bit about, uh, because uh, I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, citizens and the state and the relation to the state that citizens in uh, specifically Martinique have uh, around this uh, uh, institution Bumidom. So. And I really like, this picture is actually the Fort Saint Louis Fort de France, for those of you who know Fort de France. Uh, it's uh, near the uh, Fort de France Bay. Uh, and uh, you have like the French flag floating. So I was trying to have it like fully displayed. It did not happen when I was there. So it's, <laughs> but I think it's an interesting, interesting picture taken like a few years ago. So, 
Uh, let me start by telling you about Victor M. Victor uh, wrote to uh, the prefect of Martinique in 1964. Uh, Victor lives, uh, lived at the time in the DJ district uh, for the France in Martinique, which is kind of a mixed social class uh, district. You have like, both popular classes, people who left the rural areas of Martinique had left them in the previous decade, but it's also where you have the house of the prefect. Um, and uh, in his letter to the representative, the highest representative of the French state, uh, um, Raphael Petit, he explains a number of difficulties. Uh, he explains that he can't find a job, that he argues about his lack of connection to the political world, which explain, which supposedly explains the reason why he doesn't have a job. He explains his daily difficulties, and he. He, he tell the prefet that he is his last resort. And uh, he also mentions that he got, he obtained uh, the colonial medal in Indochina, that he's a veteran. Uh, he says that he wants to leave uh, Martinique uh, with the help of the prefet. At first he mentions French Guiana, uh, and he's a, he's a skilled worker, and he wants to go to French Guiana. And uh, later in his letter, exp he explained that he's also willing to go to mainland France. Uh, in the files in which uh, you can find this letter in the territorial archives of Martinique, uh, you have a number of exchanges between s different services. And before answering uh, Victor, the prefet actually uh, asks the police, and more specifically the Renseignement Généraux, to write a report on Victor. And in uh, the in said report, is explained the fact that he indeed got uh, several decorations while uh, being a veteran. However, the uh, general opinion on Victor's uh, file is reserved. It's reserved because uh, with, uh, with regard to the morality of Victor M, who is said to be drinking too much, uh, a later social investigation confirmed his alcoholism, uh, which according to a social worker who also conducted a report on Victor, uh, explain his inability to hold a job. And eventually, as we go through uh, the file, we understand that Victor was not part of a group of nine Martinican who were to live to um, uh, French Guiana in the following weeks. Um, in, at the same period, another man, Yves, who was 29 at the time, so it's still like around uh, April, May 1964, uh, a man who lives in Terre Saint-Ville in Fort-de-France, downtown Fort-de-France, in the very working class neighborhood. Uh, in, 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 and he also writes to the prefect to uh, uh, ask for help to get a job. Uh, he, um, uh, and in his case, the uh, Renseignement Généraux report is actually positive. Uh, and uh, that means, uh, and it's positive despite a previous conviction for lack of insurance. So we don't exactly know what it means. It was for a motorcycle or something. Uh, but um, there's a lack of insurance. Uh, in both cases, for Victor and for Eve, uh, um, is mentioned the fact that they have no known political sympathies, that there's a sort of political neutrality. Uh, but um, um, contrary to Victor, Eve is going to get institutional support to leave uh, the island. Uh, these letters were written uh, while uh, the process of departmentalization that um, Sylvain uh, mentioned uh, began like nearly 20 years before. And as most of you know, it's uh, uh, this process that uh, was supposed to be like a sort of judicial assimilation of uh, a number of uh, territories. Uh, and it basically meant for uh, uh, the people who actually supported the legislation, but also for um, ordinary citizens, that it meant equality more than anything else. That meant becoming fully equal, that to complete the process of becoming part of the citizenry that had started one century uh, before. In particular, what mattered was an extension of labor rights, an extension of social rights and social benefits to that part of the citizenry. Uh, for people who had officially been citizens for almost a century at the end of the abolition of slavery. 
but as work by a number of historians I should, I'm thinking about the work of Shilders, of Jean-Pierre Sainton, Maël Lavener, but others as well, uh, the hopes were quickly dashed uh, and the unequal structures of these societies as well as the racial hierarchies inherited from slavery and colonization remain very prevalent uh, in these places. But something happens in the 60s. From the, the 60s onward, uh, for the reasons uh, mentioned by, by Silva, there's a sort of acceleration of departmentalization uh, in the context of high unemployment uh, and also a, con a context of political unrest with the first urban riots in, um, in, 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 in Martinique in 1959. So among the measures there, the creation of, uh, of Bumidam, which is of course central to our uh, project. And within that project, uh, one thing that I'd like to analyze more precisely is, um, um, and I think I have a slide for this. <laughs> <coughs> Within that project, one thing that I'd like to analyze more precisely is um, um, what it meant to have the Bumidam while the political, institutional, economic, and social uh, transformations of the 1960s and, and 70s until the number of consequences for the ordinary citizens, including those who are not highly politicized. And the reason why I'm adding these two pictures is because here, uh, on the upper side of the slide, you have a picture of the highly politicized segment of the population, the people who uh, um, um, try to transform this uh, political popular unrest into a political movement, who started a sort of national um, um, a movement, pro-independence movement in Martinique, and who were highly politicized about the question of Bumidam in general and departmentalization and denouncing uh, the false hopes of departmentalization. The picture below is uh, from a documentary that was um, done on Bumidam and represents a family, an ordinary family that considered that Bumidam was an opportunity to um, leave the island and to, and who we, we have not much uh, regarding their political views, but they were actually the target of Bumidam, and there were those who, who climbing the social ladder actually mattered. And it's true that in um, part of what I'd like to explore in uh, that part of the project is like what it meant for uh, ordinary people to actually be in this place that was being transformed very rapidly, we'll go back to it in a minute, but who also uh, was uh, the center of a number of um, um, political or social movements. Uh, and uh, more specifically, I'm interested in the ordinary relationship to the state, to politics during this period of important transformation, where you have at the same time an improvement of living standards, significant improvement of living standards. I was talking about Tersainville, which is a neighborhood where Eve uh, lived in Fort de France. That's a moment when uh, they start having sewage, where you have like better houses that are being constructed, when the, all of the urban policy of Emesisia is, is starting to to really take shape. And at the same time, there's a massive unemployment and people cannot go to and prices are still high. So, uh, so what does that mean for these people 20 years after departmentalization? People who do not really know whether departmentalization was a failure because they can see that there are some improvements, but to them individually, what does that mean practically to uh, be a citizen? This society, the society that starts, I mean, that society that exists in Martinique, but also in Guadeloupe at the beginning of Vimidam, is a society that is being, uh, that is, um, uh, transitioning from uh, being organized around uh, the plantation and agriculture toward a society of consumption, a society of services, but also a society of mass unemployment. And so in that context, what are the wishes, the aspiration of these uh, people? Uh, in return, after wondering the relation to the state of people, we can also analyze the centrality of migration uh, uh, and departure and exile as a tool of government of these territories. And um, uh, so we have some elements, of course, and, and Silva already talked about them. Janoé is going to talk more about, about them as well. But to what extent do these phenomena actually uh, help us document uh, empirically a sort of colonial legacy in um, these um, territories? Uh, and these are kind of the questions that guide my uh, interest in this prefectural uh, archives. I have no idea when I started. Indeed. Uh, no, we're not keeping it. No, and we didn't start. Okay, I'm fine. I'm okay. <laughs> 
Um, and I think that there are three directions that we can uh, take that I view so far regarding uh, these issues. So first, we could, and I'm going to explore only one of them. Uh, first, we can uh, explore, as I said, migration as a central tool for governing the French Caribbean at the Bumidon era. And that was actually one of our core hypotheses when you applied for this grant. The fact that migration seems to be the central tool uh, for public policy, for social public policy, for uh, professional training policies, for family policies, for actually repressive policies as well. Uh, and that it seems to be that it seems that the answer to a number of very different problems is migration, having people leave um, uh, the island. And so while it is a sort of big hypothesis that looks great when you apply to a grant. So, but it's something that we'll try to see for each, uh, for a number of sectors. How does it uh, work really? Because it seems like it um, um, from where we are. The second direction is also to look at the way uh, working on Bumidam Elpas captures a state in action uh, in the French overseas ter territories post-departmentalization. Um, and in particular, in line with my uh, previous work, I'd like to be able to document the way in which associations and uh, citizen groups have contributed to shaping the action of the state and the treatment of people living uh, with Bumidam. As Sylvain said, Bumidam is actually a pretty weak institution that has difficulties imposing its purpose to the rest of the French government and the French administrations. You know, how do you explain that you're going to build like a sort of specific uh, access to a number of services, etc.? How do you justify that? And at the same time, um, it's there, and the memory of Vimidam is so painful, so you need to do something uh, uh, with, with that. But what we realize, and something from, also something that we see uh, in the archive, is that there is a competition between uh, big established organizations and Vimidam. Organizations that try to say, okay, we know, the thing, we know the things better, so we can actually do the work better than Vimidam, give us the money. So uh, that's the second direction that we uh, would like to, and I'm thinking specifically of Kazodam, whose action has partly been tackled by Sylvain uh, in his work on the Voyage Vacances. The third direction I'm in the, um, identifying and that I'll talk about not very extensively because I have no time, uh, is that um, it, this uh, general uh, project and perspective allow us to see and to capture how citizens of Martinique and Guadeloupe appeal to the prefect. In this, in this way, it seems to me that expectations of the state are emerging, allowing for a detailed understanding of what citizenship means in practical terms, whose who's would decide to write to the most powerful representative of the state on the island. Sometimes writing to the prefect just means that you're writing to the highest level of the administration. You know, you wrote to social security services, and then, I mean, uh, logically it goes there because it's, uh, in terms of hierarchy, is the superior for a number of services that exist there. But sometimes there's a, a direct appeal to the, uh, um, the, the prefect as a representative of the state because it represents something symbolic. And there's a whole literature on writing to presidents, writing to higher officials that uh, we'd like to, um, to uh, explore. Um, in return, the written exchanges with citizens as well as with various local and national uh, administrative services, the exchanges between Bumid, uh, the prefect and Bumidam, the prefect and a number of institutions, uh, show uh, how practically the French state constructs the need for specific treatment in these territories since, uh, uh, despite uh, departmentalization. And by looking at this, uh, at this letter, we actually hear a number of voices and we see um, uh, the French state, the expectations of the French citizens with, uh, who have all of the rights attached to, uh, to citizenship. It is important for us to note that these voices appear in a particularly fragmented way and uh, that we must literally go looking for them. It's part of the job. <laughs> <But> <coughs> But as part of our collective project, um, we are actually building a database uh, 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 with the uh, individual files that are located in uh, Pierre Fitt uh, in Paris. Uh, because the people who moved via the Bumidum uh, were the subject of social and political investigation, as we've seen for even Victor. But the archives in Paris are logically the archives of people who went through the process and who were accepted. So, uh, and for whom the opinion 
opinion was favorable. And so we expected to find traces of refusals in the local Bermudan archives in Martinique and Guadeloupe, except that these archives don't exist anymore, only fragments of them. They, did not, uh, they were not uh, kept properly everywhere, uh, which is revealing of the relationship uh, with the very close past in these territories. For, I mean, for those of you who work on archives in French Guiana, for instance, it's something that's, that's, I mean, that's uh, um, but it also implies for us, from a methodological perspective, trying to find elsewhere possible traces of the unfortunate candidates for departure who did not get through the process. And that's why we, um, well, I went to the prefectural archive seeking sort of these traces. How can we find stuff? And we do find things. Um, um, and we see this fragment based on exchanges between prefect and other administrative services. Um, uh, and uh, in this interaction, uh, we find letters like the ones of Eve and Victor, and we see that there are a number of expectations that the rights, their rights as citizens will be respected. Right to retirement, right to benefit from the social security, so you have lots of things in the social security archives. But there's also a will to help their families by living. Going to France via Bimida means that you'll be able to provide financially. Uh, 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 in another letter, a man who lives in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Fort de France said that he was waiting for to go via Bimidam and got sick, which prevents him to do all of his job. Job in Martinique is like, like le, le petit boulot. Um, and he asked for financial assistance and the prefect sends him 150 francs. Um, uh, and that in itself is a testimony that the safety net and welfare state that were supposed to come along with departmentalization are not there and there's an expectation. Practically, what does that mean for um, um, these people? Um, also, often you have the mention of you are my last resort, you're my last hope, which might be only rhetorical, but also to me means uh, uh, um, something. It's a case of a man who writes because the Bimidam has closed his files and he considers that it's an arbitrary decision and that prevents him from starting a process of family reunification. And so he appeals to the prefet saying, okay, you know what, I wanted to live, I'm willing to live. And Bimidam is like uh, not doing the right thing, so help me. Um, so, such an investigation may, I mean, show that there are some apparent contradictions, because basically people are encouraged to go, but they're also waiting to go. Uh, so clearly, the issue of qualification might be one uh, element that could explain uh, exactly why. I mean, the, the reasons why some people would be vetted and not go. But it's also a way to understand that uh, the production of public policies actually is driven by a number of forces, and among these forces especially at the beginning of the period in 1964, is the fact that um, uh, an organization like Casodom, who is contributing to the general public policy, doesn't want anyone to go. They want uh, to give a good image of the rest of the group. It is pressuring the government to just send the elite of the working class so they uh, will not face racism. They consider, they acknowledge the existence of racism, but they, okay, in order not to have racism, just send the good ones, uh, which is not what the uh, uh, incentive of the uh, government is a, a few years after that. So just looking at these letters is, or in these exchanges is also a way to look at the evolution of the policy in terms and the, con and the potential contradictions in um, um, implementing uh, such uh, policy. And I'll just uh, finish with the fact that it seems to me that uh, analyzing the relationship to the state in this territory is particularly important. A recent event in Martinique, in Guadeloupe, in the Rainy Island, in French Guiana, uh, show that clearly this relation to the state, to the central state, has been in a very, I mean, a quasi permanent crisis for, and uh, with at the same time an incapacity of the state to actually respond uh, to a crisis. It, provoked by uh, setting a, democra I mean, a, a number of public policies that were apparently not totally adapted to uh, the field, but also the difficulties in these territories to actually forge an emancipating collective uh, project. I thank you for your attention. I have no idea how long I, I spoke, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.
into London. What political and institutional logics? Uh, the presenter is Janwe Vulbu. Uh, Janwe is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the University of Lille. Um, it's, again, like all of our panelists, published widely um, and is a co-author of or a co-editor of an edited volume. Um, I'm going to talk about the of after the end of the Birmingham in 1981, um, two institutions have succeeded it. Uh, first, the ANT, uh, <coughs> Agence Nationale pour l'Insertion des Travailleurs d'Outre-Mer. Um, which started just after the end of the Bumidum, and then uh, LADOM, l'Agence de l'Outre-mer pour la Mobilité, which started in 2006 and it's still on today. The two of them are focused mainly on helping the population from overseas territory to move to the metropole, mainly to get a better education, um, professional training, uh, and eventually uh, um, sp well, specific uh, uh, professional training uh, that does not exist in their territory, and also to uh, strengthen the links between the metropole and its former colonies. While the Birmingham was um, quite stable in its mission and its institutional frame, ANT and LADOM are uh, constantly facing critics about the action and also regularly compelled to change and to implement internal reforms. So the question that I'm asking is why those in two institutions perpetuated in spite of the critics they receive? Why um, are they still on today? Uh, uh, why is there still on today a kind of Birmingham? We'll see that the complexity that are at the heart of those institutions are quite similar to the tension that was facing the members of the Bumidom. Um, with this main question um, that uh, um, Audrey and Sylvain uh, highlighted, should people from overseas territory being ruled by specific or common laws? Those tensions must be understood within the larger evolution of the French state and politics, and also the situation of overseas territory, mainly uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe and La Réunion. What I'm going to present today is an ongoing research, mainly based on archives, uh, especially for the INT, and interviews, uh, six interviews uh, conducted with LADAM's member. Um, I started a couple of months ago, so there are still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> First, I'm going to introduce these two institutions and their evolution. Uh, then I'm, I will highlight the critics and then I will try to explain why finally they had such a durability. At the turn of the 80s, the institution Bumidum is uh, fully discredited, is facing violent critics from independentist movement. They're calling it a slaver institution, accusing it of emptying the overseas territory. The famous writer and politician from Martinique, M. E. Césaire, is even talking about a genocide by substitution. For the newly elected socialist government, ending the Birmingham was a way to dismiss former right-wing politics towards uh, the overseas territory. Henri Emanuelli, the Secretary d'État uh, en charge des Dom-Tom, claimed that his government wanted to abolish colonialism, even though it had also a pragmatic view in mind, stopping the flow of people from overseas to uh, better respond to the economic needs in metropole. The INT replaced the Bumidum in 1982, but it's only in 83 with the uh, des Assises pour les, les, les l'Outre-mer and, and the publication of the Rapport Lucas that the new lines for overseas are drawn. The idea of the government is that even if they should end mass displacement policies for workers, they should take into consideration what they call a specific handicap of this population, which Sorry, which are manifested by the difficulties of integration into the metropolitan society or the so-called uh, difficulties. The reasons of the handicap are mainly considered as being a loss of identity that would suffer this population. Also a lack of education due to poor school overseas and finally the problem of racism in metropole. Then the government adopted this ambiguous position of ending specific laws, but at the same time pointing specific problems of this population that should in the end lead back to specific programs for this population. Pierre Mauroy, the Premier Minister, resumed this position by saying that this population needs a specific attention within the frame of normal procedure. 
In the end, the government put the stress mainly on education and professional training. On one hand, uh, what I call uh, on, on one hand, and what I call identity programs on the other hand. So the fight against racism, especially in the housing, uh, the acknowledgement of Creole culture, summer camps for uh, overseas children, cultural program like theater, for instance. The NT was also supposed to be different from the Bimidam by also not being only central state policy but also including local governments from overseas. Uh, Amy Césaire, for instance, uh, became a board mem member of the NT. All those changes were also involved in a greater transformation of the socialist policies in the 80s. Uh, larger devolution, the right to difference with uh, regional languages, uh, the fight against racism. The two hands of this program continued until 1983, when the Balladur right-wing government decided to cut the budget of this institution from 90 to 60 million, so the INT had to focus only on uh, education and professional training. What is interesting is that uh, what was for only as a changing the name of the institution from INT to uh, LADAM, in fact was a broader change and a get back to a more social program following the mass protests of 2008-2009. Uh, um, in addition to the professional training program, the government added what was called uh, continuité territoriale, which was supposed to help families that were split between overseas and metropole to get a better connection, so mainly helping them financially with uh, plane tickets. Today, LIDAM has a budget of uh, 60 million, more or less, uh, 150 people working for it and helping about 35,000 people per year. So what are the critics of um, INT and LADAM? Well, exactly the ambiguities that were at the core of the creation of this institution, specific programs for overseas people or common law. One of the speech from Pierre Mauroy is very interesting. He says that there is no way of creating a parallel administration for overseas people. Uh, we must accommodate public administration to difference. This tension culminated at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, Georges Paul Langevin, the former director of the INT and a famous socialist politician, expressed a doubt um, about it. She says, "We don't know yet if we should ensure that common laws. How um, we, we don't know, sorry. So we don't know yet if we should ensure that common laws are well used by people from overseas, or if we need more budgets and specific measures." <laughs> Gérard Bellorget, an important public servant and specialist of the overseas territories, expressed his fear about the INT. He said, we consider that the INT has a tendency to particularism regarding issues that should be solved through common law. This is dangerous because it creates an administrative ghetto. These arguments are going to be used by the right to cut the budget of the INT at the beginning of the 90s. More recently, LADAM faced the same kind of critics, mainly from the Cour des Comptes, an institution that is in charge of the surveillance of public funds. In a context of a more uh, neoliberal policies in France, this institution asked about the relevance of uh, specific funds for overseas people. Member of the Cour des Comptes stated in two different reports, one in 2011 and the second in 2019, that there is not enough connection with um, broader institutions or normal institutions such as uh, Pôle emploi, the French employment agency. Member of the Cour des Comptes clearly wonders if LADAM should disappear in the end. Uh, they state, without ignoring the particularities of the situation in the overseas territory, the court believes that the strong demands for an improvement in the employment, situa in, uh, employment situation in these territories make it necessary to move away from a logic of symbolic identification, leading to the existence of a specific operator without consideration of its efficiency. On the contrary, the expectation of the beneficiaries' concern encourage us to take advantage of the capacities, resources, and networks of specialized national operators, such as Pôle emploi. And if the proposed middle path were not taken, the very question of LADAM sustainability would be quickly raised." End quote. So why Ante and LADAM survive in spite of those critics?
Well, that's the thing that I'm working on at the moment, but I can stress a couple of explanations that are interrelated and that are very linked with this tension. Are the people from overseas different? Are the territory different? And should, should, be, should they be treated in a different way? So first of all, overseas territory are facing a permanent bad economic situation. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, with a high rate of unemployment, high cost of living, strong inequalities. And every time the, the social situation gets too tense, the government rely on specific institutions such as ANT and la DOM to calm down the situation. So for instance, just after the social movement of 2008 and 2009, the government increased the budget of la DOM to 100 million and expanded its mission to the continuité territoriale I was mentioning before. The government believes that institutions such as la DOM are well identified by the inhabitants of overseas territories. Putting an end to this situation could be a risk uh, by increasing resentment towards a central state. Also, INT and then la DOM always has a strong support from the Ministère des Outre-mer and is also supported by local networks. This is very clear, for instance, with uh, Georges Poulangemin, uh, who was the former head of the ANT and who became the Ministre des Outre-mer in 2014. The support is also from local employers' networks. Um, the current president of LADOM, uh, Philip Jock, for instance, used to be uh, the MEDEF uh, president. There is this belief that the LADOM could be a tool to uh, bring back uh, young people that were uh, trained in, um, in metropole uh, and, would not, and they would not stay in metropole but uh, come back to um, the overseas territory. Finally, it's also interesting to see how people that are working at la DOM, uh, especially, the, uh, especially people that are strongly in contact with the public of la DOM, create the idea of difference, this idea of a specific population. When I interviewed them, they were explaining how, how, how the people from overseas were lost when they arrive at the airport uh, in Metropole, in, usually in Paris, um, justifying their own mission of bringing them from the airport to the house, uh, something that uh, Pôle, Pôle emploi, for instance, would never do. What is also interesting is that almost all the people I met from LADOM have a link with the overseas territory and most of, most of them are black women with a strong commitment to, to do spaces. Even if they are cautious not to talk about race uh, within the context of a colorblind institution, um, I could feel in their speech uh, a specific willingness to help people from overseas with, with a sort of, if not racial solidarity, at least a territorial solidarity. And this is very important because a lot of public servants uh, in the Outre-mer are criticized by the local population as being uh, white, coming from the metropole and not knowing anything about the, the islands except for the touristic, uh, the touristic cliché. So it might be something quite important between uh, Laddam's people and their public, um, this kind of a, a, a strong connection. That is uh, one of the research directions that I'm uh, digging it at the moment and uh, I'm going to end up here. Thank you very much.